Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us here at International Print Center New York for this conversation with artist Vanessa German and Assembly Room. I'm Jen Bradovich. I'm IPCNY's Exhibition and Curatorial Manager. I am a white woman with brown hair in a bun and bangs, and I'm wearing a black shirt and cardigan and tortoiseshell glasses. I am in IPCNY's Chelsea, New York space now in front of one of three incredible works by Vanessa German that we have in the gallery right now. I have to tell you that I was stunned by the sumptuous materiality of these mixed media pieces on New York Times Magazine covers that feature images of Venus Williams in profile. In the piece next to me called Venus in Crown, Williams wears a sculptural assemblage of glitter, beads, synthetic hair, an array of like disco ball mirrors. And all of this comes out several inches from the wall. It's incredible. I'm so excited that Vanessa is joining us tonight so we can hear more about her multidisciplinary practice. The work is on view now as part of our fall program, Living in America, an exhibition in four acts curated by Assembly Room. Living in America is a group exhibition of contemporary work about the generative power of art in times of political and social crisis. And it's organized in four thematic acts like a play. Act one, outrage, and act two, love, were previously on view in the gallery. Then we had a little intermission during which we reinstalled the space with a brand new set of works comprising act three, hope, and act four, care. The exhibition is on view until December 19th, so I encourage you to book your reservations to see the show now at ipcny.org visit. Living in America is also presented online with a few additional works and texts. You can find it on our digital exhibition portal where we've been sharing our program virtually during COVID-19 at ipcnyexhibitions.org slash living in America. But really trust me, you want to see Venus in Crown in person. So please do make an appointment and come by. Tonight is the final of four online programs that we've done for Living in America. This series of conversations paired exhibiting artists with our curators, Assembly Room, and each program was tied thematically to one of the exhibition's four acts. The theme of tonight's conversation is care. Tonight's program has live captioning. You can turn it on by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen on desktop or by accessing the settings menu of the Zoom mobile app. The talk will also be recorded and available online in about a week or so. Please use the Q&A box throughout the night to ask questions, which we'll take at the end. We'll probably run to about 8 or 8.15. So now I will welcome to join me on screen, both Vanessa German and one of our Living in America curators, Natasha Becker of Assembly Room. Assembly Room was founded by Natasha along with Paola Gallio and Yulia Topchi as a curatorial collective that works to empower women identifying curators living and working in New York City and beyond and strives to create a more global and diverse ecosystem for art. Natasha will be leading our conversation with Vanessa tonight and Yulia and Paola will join us a little bit later on in the program. So with that, I will hand it off to Natasha for this conversation on the topic of care for which we are guided by Audre Lorde who said, caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation and that is an act of political warfare. Natasha, please take it away. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that great introduction, Jen, and welcome to all our participants and attendees um, to my home in Brooklyn, New York, um, and uh, a very warm and hearty welcome to Vanessa German tonight. Um, I'm just so excited and thrilled to speak to Vanessa and um, to share some of the work that we've been doing together, um, but mostly because she's one of my favorite people in the whole entire world. And I love her so much and I have such great respect for her work. And so it's such a joy and such a pleasure to have this conversation this evening. So welcome everyone. Um, Living in America, the exhibition that Jen um, 
gave such a great introduction to and which some of you may have seen or may still want to see was really shaped by this turbulent year that we've had in the US uh, dealing with racism, police violence, a global health pandemic, unemployment, political, a political election that um, despite a more positive turnout has revealed the deep uh, racial and economic inequalities in this country. And so, you know, it's been a, 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 a tough year uh, to say the least. Um, and so it's especially exciting and, and joyful tonight to conclude the exhibition and the series with this talk um, and with this theme uh, of the final act in, in Living in America, uh, the theme of care and love um, for each other and for our fellow humans. Um, and Vanessa embodies as, as, as a person and as an artist, you know, she embodies what I call the sort of big C's, um, community, compassion, care, connection, um, critique, celebration. And those are the kinds of values that I think are so essential and um, to and such a core part of printmaking, actually. A lot of our previous talks, um, whether uh, for, the, for the Zoom programs for the show or in connection with the big print co conference that took place last month, um, have centered on printmaking as a medium and, you know, in terms of its subject matter and its techniques and its, you know, communities. Um, but what was really uh, inspired us to include Vanessa in this show were, what were these values that she really embodies um, in a practice that is so eclectic um, uh, and rich. And so she is, you know, she's a poet, she's a sculptor, she's a visual artist, she's a teacher, she's a performer, she's a community activist. Um, she is just, you know, this rich complex um, person and, and artist. And so tonight we're gonna talk a little bit about how all those values are embodied both in, you know, her um, ideas and her ethics, as well as in her art practice and, and in her life. And um, so, Vanessa, welcome. Um, I'm so excited to speak to you tonight and to share your work with uh, everyone here. So we'll, we'll jump right in. Uh, I will share my screen um, so that we have some images um, to touch upon while we, while we chat. Um, and, you know, the best place is always to start at the beginning. And so that's where we will start sort of at the beginning of where um, things started to uh, cohere and um, uh, evolve for, for Vanessa in, in Pittsburgh, where she lives and works. Um, and that's how we organize this so that you get both the sense of where she's located and where she's created a lot of her work, um, as well as her practice in the, in the world at large. Thank you, Natasha. Hello, everyone. I love the sound of those chimes in the background. <laughs> so soothing. Yeah, I, I forget all of the sounds that are available, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so here we are at the art house. Um, this is our first slide. Uh, and the art house is located in Pittsburgh. Um, where, where Vanessa lives as, as well. So Vanessa, tell us a little bit about the art house, um, how it started, what it meant to you, what it is today. So um, thanks again to everyone at IPCNY and um, the brilliance of Assembly Room for um, everything that you are and everything that you do. Um, that you bring to the world and to our communities. I'm Vanessa and I am a black woman with a heart-shaped face. I have my hair in a kind of messy bun. I'm wearing a peak sweater. I have uh, 
gap tooth smile and I live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on Haudenosaunee land, Seneca Nation land that was violently taken. And I am here on this land existing in love as courageously as I can, which is incredibly difficult and which is incredibly challenging. Um, it's like the most extraordinary challenge of my life is to exist daily, um, to thrive and to sustain my dimensional being with love, which I describe and um, some of the ways I um, define love is creative understanding, redemptive, transformative goodwill. And the house that we see on the screen right now is a bright electric blue house on a cloudy overcast Pittsburgh day. Um, there's a Palestinian flag hanging from the porch. There's glass mosaic stars and hearts and eyes all over the house. There is glass mosaic text on the front porch of the house that says we are all here together. There's a poem on the stairs that says being at the art house where you realized you had wings the whole time. So I um, at really a cliff of life and death about 15, 16 years ago, really critically put my life um, into my own hands in, um, in, in an effort to really find a way to keep myself whole and alive and thriving. And so what I did for six months was whatever I wanted to do. I left, I did what felt right for my body. I uh, gathered materials that felt really alive and electric and magnetic that drew me to them. And every day for six months, I just made things in my basement, which is a, which a basement of a house I lived in, which is three blocks away from the blue house that you see on the screen. A little girl watched me in the basement one day for hours. She watched me make art through this little tiny window. And I realized that the same thing that happened to me when I was in my studio was sort of happening to this little girl, my neighbor, who was like six at the time and that she was really captivated and, and sort of like transported in this moment of just participating in art making by watching me do it. So after that point, I started to just sit on my front stoop with clay on an old ironing board and I would bring out my cameras and all the kids would come around and they would say, um, what are we gonna do today? Like teach us this. And so we would just play and make art together. Eventually we moved from my front porch at that house to a porch that I had at the house when I bought my first house down the street. And I learned from what happened to the August Wilson Center um, before, uh, you know, er, in its early years that I, it was really important to me to create a space to, um, for the art house to exist for this place where um, anybody can come and have a moment of making of creativity to access um, materials to enliven and bring physicality to something from their imagination right in their neighborhood at a walkable place from their house and that um, there was very little obstacle to having that kind of experience. And from doing it on my front porch to borrowing a house from the low income housing agency, I really knew that it was important for me to create a space that nobody could take away from us. So I sold a couple of sculptures to one great American museum and I bought two houses right next to each other. And the house that you're looking at right now is the art house. Um, there's a heart on the front door and an eye and the, uh, the door says yes. And there's an arrow pointing to the doorknob of the door and it says yes and anybody can come in when the door is open there's lots of art supplies there's a reading room because one of the things i learned really early in sharing um my own personal space my front porch to for people in my neighborhood to make art is that not everybody's an artist some people just want to come and be in a space that feels different so the art house is open for backyard sitting for garden sitting for there's a reading room and then there's lots of space for making. And it was um, all of the mosaic that you see on the house was done by so many different people in the neighborhood. They would wait for the bus and make work on the mosaic a little bit. Um, I mean, literally the woman across the street from me is 90 years old and she worked on the mosaic. It was something that um, makes people really proud. They have their thing that they made and all of the stars on the house are, um, 
they represent people. So people who helped me pay for the house by sponsoring the stars that are all over the house. That's incredible. And I, I recently saw one of your Insta talks, Instagram talks, where you talked about your love of folk art and um, as you know, folk art being your first love. And when I'm looking at the blue house, um, I see, you know, these symbols that appear in your art as well. Um, you know, the eye, the other uh, toward of the evil eye, um, toward of evil, um, the heart, the stars. Um, uh, and, you know, can you say a little bit more about um, your love of folk art and how that has informed this this space but also your own work and you know we can um... yes yeah, so thank you for asking me that question because i often like if you saw that instagram talk i've definitely been asked a couple of times really pointedly to not talk about my love of folk art or my work in relationship to folk art because of uh, the perception of it, but I really think that it's, I own that love uh, in the value of my deepest heart, because for me, in folk art, there is a way that a spirit within the work, a magic within the work, uh, a place where the mysterious necessity of the being who made that work with their own hands gathered the material that it that it, uh, it sort of vibrates with this like electric life and necessity for the object to be made, not just to have the object, but because the human who made it needed to make it, that it, their entire being, their lung system was driven in the creation of that object. And that's really something that electric life that reaches out to me um, when I see folk art. I realize that I'm looking at the language of someone's soul. I'm looking at um, a very a unique vibration of being in every piece of folk art that I have seen. And there's something to me about the deep love Love that exists in the space of expansive accessibility to uh, into creation for anybody to pick up the material that exists right where you are and to transform that material um, at, at your own will in your own space and time and intimacy for your own reasons for your own ways right where you are that is really speaks powerfully to me um, about one of the most sort of grounded forces of my humanity, which is creativity, this like way that we move with curiosity and like the sort of winding rivers of inspiration into, into things and into making. And so there's a way that the art house is this sort of monument, this sort of massive folk art sculpture that um, takes on the voices and the hands and the spirit of everybody who touched it and everybody who worked on it and everyone who um, sort of saved their own life through the space because like this photo that you're looking at that says stop shooting me love you uh, there were so many shootings in my neighborhood and I grew up in Los Angeles so I was actually really surprised to move to Pittsburgh and see how much street death how much um, how many shootings there were like it really felt out of place to me having grown up in Los Angeles in the 80s and 90s to have moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in the 2000s and seen an astronomical amount of street death. And I remember um, I made the Stop Shooting Me Love You signs after baby Marcus was killed an 18 month old was shot to death in a city park, um, not that far away from where I live. And I remember standing out on the street, his funeral was around the corner from my house and I knew it was happening. And I just stood out on the street while they brought this little tiny casket out of this church. And I remember, you know, just feeling and sensing all of these nuances around how, like, I wonder if the person who did this, who is watching this happen, I will just thinking about how many lives just were sort of thrashed in the tsunami that came after this um, infant's murder. And I, and, and I just remember thinking, you know, to the, 
to different people who had taken up guns and done things that, you know, your people love you. Your people are not going to stop loving you because you did this act. And perhaps you are not as connected to that love or you don't feel that love or that love isn't moving. It's forced through your life in a way that um, would have prevented you from doing this act. I have these sometimes really like, you know, glittery expansive ways of holding this. I have a lot of human romance. I know that. But so I started to make these signs that say, stop shooting me, love you. And I used grant money that the Heinz Foundation gave me to make art. And so what I ended up telling the foundation was that the signs were each individual works of art and my entire community was the gallery because they just ended up being in yards all over my neighborhood and then all over America. And then they went different places around the world. And um, that those once I made that sign it was really wonder it was sort of um interesting to me how people started to make other signs after that there were people who made signs about their specific loved ones who were killed and they would put these signs that sort of looked like political yard signs up but you could see the ripple effect of making these signs that say stop shooting we love you and it just created you created such a reconnection to that love where there was such disconnection um, exists from that love um, and hence, you know, uh, this, this violence um, and sort of trying to reconcile um, what that could be for people in the context of love and in the context, and it's of, love, a, in the context of connection. Or I was asking a, a lot of love in printing those signs. I asked a lot of, uh, you know, an 18 by 24 piece of plastic with six words printed on it. I was asking for there to be an arc, like a sort of like instantaneous lightning strike of recognition in the hearts of people who saw that, that they would be triggered by maybe the thinking about the eyes of their little sister or their grandmother, just anything. But I was really asking for love to, to show up in a real way um, with that. And I definitely, you know, that was like an act of faith on my part because man, I was like ridiculed and like just so many things when those first signs came out and it wasn't, you know, some, some very sad things you know, even happened around those signs. And so it just, I'm saying that because like there's, the things look one way and there I realized that more than one thing is always happening at the same time. So the I signs were, have had a ripple effect, but it's definitely not all romance, but it all yeah. has been as muscular as love is. Mm -hmm. It's just like been a really powerful it's been a powerful um, movement. And raising tough questions, you know, that um, I think is w what, what comes up is, you know, this kind of really having to ask oneself or one's, you know, family members or one's partners or just in, having to ask these really tough questions, you know, about who, we are and you know what we are and how we are you know um and i think that's that 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 questioning is implied in that love you know um this this next slide slide three um and slide four are you know from this wonderful and amazing opening we had at the ford foundation gallery um, it's amazing. Had the absolute honor of being able to propose and invite Vanessa to open the gallery, um, the new gallery last year. And uh, I think there were like a thousand people at the opening and Vanessa led a procession through the galleries and into the garden um, courtyard, which is what you see in the slide. Um, she's in the center in this stunning blue costume that she'll talk a little bit more about um and you know i'm just so struck by the way people are also looking at you in this image um i have another image here um but 
you know, you have this rapt audience, you know, and we were all sort of mesmerized and following you through this procession and, you know, listening to your voice um, as you recited this incredible um, spoken word, poetry, praise, poem, um, you know, just, it was, I mean, so incredible. And I, I wish we had some sound so we could just hear that right now. But um, performance and poetry, and also reminding me a little bit of these traditions from Africa around the griot and the, you know, the praise singer um, that would open ceremonies or, you know, um, important events, uh, usually would be the oral historian of the community, you know, um, and so would recount all the, um, histories of the person or the town or the, the community in this, you know, sort of epic um, pra uh, praise poem. And, and I, I see that strong connection between Africa and uh, America and African-American people consistently through, throughout your work. So can you tell us a little bit more about your performance work and your poetry and the, you know, how these two connect um, and articulate as well this, uh, you know, this deep and loving connection between the two. Yes, I, uh, I have a recognition that I live inside of knowing that my soul is expansive and is present and that I can call um, I can call a thing up out of my soul. I think about how Ella Fitzgerald just said, like, I'm not just singing the song, I'm bringing the song up. I'm bringing the song out. And I recognized in that like really special six months of my life where I was really trying to figure out how to stay in my body because I was, it was a real struggle but I would go to this place when I was inside of making the work and inside of this, it's like the inside of the inside of my inside place where there was like such a clear voice directly to my imagination, to my heart, to my creativity that I could like call up a clarity of language and I could call up a clarity of purpose that could be, um, that could be transcribed into language. And so in this Ford Foundation performance, I'm performing really the first work that taught me that I could put the sound, I could put actual love, true love, pure love into the sound of my voice. So I can say, if my hands were anything other than hands, they would be two shooting stars galloping light across the galaxy. But I could also say that with the clearest intention of my um, edgeless soul, my timeless soul, my soul active in the simultaneity of time, I could put inside of that the truest substance of love and the sound of my voice. And so in this performance, it is really for me a connective uh, an, an act of singing on the connective tissue between every human being, between every earthling on the planet. So it is right, it was fitting that there was water very near this performance. It was fitting that we moved through a room that was filled with the artwork, with the lives, with the electric voices of so many artists, and then progressed, per, uh, did a promenade, had a parade, moved ritually through this entire space to a body of water because um, for one of the things that um, I know is true is about the power of water and how water connects us all and water is the most ancient thing and it is what makes us up most but to sing on the connective tissue between every earthling and humanity is what this performance was and it was really a way if I wish I could exist in the world like this every waking minute of my life in a way that I could sing the names of every human being who is around me up to the sky in a way that it, that sound like rings inside of their soul and bounces, you know, all around from person to person to person. Um, because this performance gives me the opportunity to very clearly um, sing love into the space and to aff affirm the power 
of human connection, to affirm the power of the fact that we are all here together and to affirm the power that is our oneness. And so this really is such a deep love song. It really is a moment to, was a moment for me to make eye contact. I think there were a thousand people there, but I looked so many people in the eyes. I held hands with people. I walked with people. I like hugged people. I kissed their cheeks. I spoke directly into their eyes, into the eyes of as many people as I could. Um, and I did that, uh, honestly, like it wasn't a performance. I did that with the truest, best parts of myself and with complete compassion for the parts of myself that are like just messy and complicated and find a difficult time being human, like with compassion and grace to those places within myself because it is, um, it's more than one thing is happening at, a, at the same time, all the time. And so I am, um, you know, I mean it critically when I say I believe in the power of art and I believe in the power of love. And I'm not just going to speak about that belief. Like Toni Morrison said, don't tell me what you believe in. Show me how what you show me how that truth can unravel the call of fear. And so that act and all of that eye contact and that collective movement was um, really an act of affirmation on the planet of the power of human beings and our um, the centralized love of our oneness at a time when that like bringing that energy and that force into the world is really medicinal and um, fu a future making force. What, what is the power of blue, Vanessa? So uh, this image on the screen right now is of me wearing a 20 foot long, a, t a skirt with a 20 foot long blue train. There's actually three colors of blue in that skirt. And I'm walking up the academical village towards the rotunda at the University of Virginia. Um, Thomas Jefferson's secret, this they call the second most sacred place on the campus of UVA, which is the academical village leading to the most sacred place, which is the rotunda rotunda where the Jefferson statue is, where um, Charlottesville, where the um, sort of mob first gathered, walked to and circled around with the torches at the campus of UVA, where they actually attacked uh, students and sent them to the hospital. But up this walkway towards, heading towards the rotunda, which is at the top of the image, um, on, I'm walking green gra gra grass and there's a blue sky. Um, Thomas Jefferson was really a genius in figuring out how to actually make invisible the enslaved people on the campus of UVA because at the time that the campus was built, you were students were not allowed to bring their slaves with them, but they could rent enslaved people from the campus and Jefferson could hide the enslaved people underground of the campus and behind those serpent those beautiful serpentine walls and so for me, the color blue, firstly, in the place in the realm of like active, livid, continual magic, the color blue is a gift. The color blue could have been any color, but the ways that it takes up shape and light and frequency and vibration that is resonant to our human selves is a gift. And so first of all, just living in the color blue, the colors of blue as a gift. And then speaking, just I'm gonna roll off the other ways that it quickly resonates for me. One is the blues. I think about Ma Rainey talking about the birth of the blues and how we don't sing the blues. Um, we don't just sing the blues. We are making more space for ourselves to be alive with the blues. Like some people don't understand the blues because they think it might just be a song, but it's not that. But it is a way for us to make our own medicine. It is a way for us to sing the buzzing uh, and the stinging and the pain and the bruises out of our body to sing those so that they evaporate in the air and they make more space for delight and joy and for our actual lungs to expand and to keep the rhythm of our hearts beating. Thinking also about water, thinking also about the, um, thinking about the ways that the color blue is used in the American flag and what that color, um, 
you know, the symbolism of the flag and this, what the color blue represents in the American flag. So when I was in like the third grade and my teacher, we were studying the American flag and studying the um, Pledge of Allegiance, um, the teacher told me that the red was stood for the blood, the white was for peace, and the blue was for glory. And I remember at, as a third grader asking the teacher, the social studies teacher, and getting in trouble when I said, who's glory, who's blood, and who's peace? Like, I'm really confused. I was honestly confused because we had just finished um, chapters on the American Indian, and I was really confused. And so I got in trouble and had to go to the office, and my mother had to inform the school that I didn't have to, that her children didn't, could ask questions if they wanted to ask them and did not have to say the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> and so, uh, but that was, all of those things come into, um, into the power of the color blue, which is also a vehicle of transformation. So using blue as a reckoning color, using blue to hold the space for our tears and the salt of our tears that come with the grief, but also the water of baptism to wash those away and the vehicle of the river of glory and the river of redemption to bring us into places of newness, to bring us into places of substantial wholeness, honoring the muscularity of all of these colors of blue to carry all of that forth. And we'll see blue reappearing in Vanessa's work and weaving its way throughout uh, sculpture, throughout performance, throughout everything really. Um, and so we've jumped, I've jumped to a uh, some of Vanessa's sculptures. Of course, she has an incredible body of sculptural work, um, which you can encounter in museums, um, in gallery exhibitions, in you know, books. Um, it, it's just extraordinary. And it comes back to what you were saying earlier when we were talking about the Blue House, um, when we were talking about making and talking about folk art and you know, um, the gathering of materials to make, to participate, to recreate. Um, and, you know, I just sort of had that thought now that, you know, while you're doing all the all these things, you are still making um, sculpture, which, you know, is so uh, it's, 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 it's time consuming, a lot of them are incredibly large, um, you know, they just they take so much energy and time as well. Um, and I think you know, both the individual sculptures, but also these much more intense um, installations um, of uh, sculptural tableaus, in a sense, um, where, you know, you taking on a particular historical moment and really reinterpreting that. Uh, and here, obviously, for me, most directly, um, is drawing on that connection again to um, historical African art and uh, African culture um, and reinterpreting that through the Americas and through the African-American experience too. Can you tell us a little bit more about the place of sculpture and these objects in, in your practice and in your life? Yes, they're, the objects that you're looking at are um, small scale assemblage sculptures with found objects. There are um, wrapped fabric sections that I call prayer beads where I'm wrapping hair or text or seeds from the trees that fall in my neighborhood. There are accumulations of nails in the chest of one of the figures that is standing on the portion, the ringer portion of an old hand um, hand turned washing machine. And these sculptures for me taught me so much. These are the sculptures, this kind of work is what helped me to find um, my frequency of being and materiality. So I was bringing home found objects on trash day, walking around on the morning of trash day and picking up pieces of wood and bringing back old skateboards that had gotten abandoned in the streets and walking around my neighborhood and going to flea markets and um, really giving myself permission to gather materials that 
felt right to me without needing to know where they were going to be placed or how I was going to use them. So I gathered, I went through a period of time of without like any giving myself any, giving myself the grace to not move in the gathering of materials with angst or anxiety about producing anything, just gathering things that spoke to me, gathering things that clicked and building up an archive of objects, right? And then listening to the relationship that those objects had to each other and creating a series of sculptures that, you know, for uh, what sounds like an oversimplification, creating objects that felt right to me, finding this relationship um, between language and um, symbols and objects and communicating in this accumulation of objects, which at the end of the six months that I was telling you about earlier, I showed some of those sculptures at like a summer arts festival and a professor from Carnegie Mellon said, hey, you're doing this thing that they have done in the Congo with the nails. And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. I just picked those nails up out of off the ground outside of my mother's studio. And they said, you should really do some research because what you're doing with those nails has been done for thousands of years. And so what happened in my practice was I had this um, external validation for something that I thought just came up innately through my system that just was in this instinctive draw to materials and instinctive use of that material. But really what I found was a technology that existed um, really deeply inside of my being. And so I was, when I made those sculptures, those six sculptures that really saved my life, I um, recognized that I had found the power to heal myself from a lot of the despair and the trauma that had been really crushing mm -hmm. my being since I was a little black girl growing up in Los Angeles. Like there is never a time in my life where I didn't know what racism is. There was never a time in my life that I didn't know what pre police brutality was. I, the first time the police threatened to put me in handcuffs, I was like seven years old or something like that. So I, found the power to um, move through just enduring an existence as a fat black girl woman on this land to having a thriving expansive spiritual um, um, existence of intellectual prowess and deep meaning to myself through these objects and so I started to call them power figures mm -hmm. and then after that professor said you should look what they're doing in the Congo I started doing research about this like long history of human technology into embodying materials with power to do um, really deliberate, clear, sometimes visible, sometimes invisible work for human beings and communities. And I realized that that line is alive inside of me. And I began to work really intentionally and magically and um, also conceptually with these ideas of power. So using actual mm -hmm. power supplies and power cords and, mm -hmm. and Blackberry powered uh, like smartphones in my work, but using them to do things that I really experienced needed to be done in the world that we live in. So a lot of these figures, the two figures that we're looking right now, I think of as reckoning works. I think of as mm -hmm. works that have to do reckoning with the lies of separation and mm -hmm. um, the submersion of multiple genocides and really reckon with um, the ringer and reckon with the shards and to be, so these figures are those reckonings, but they're also vehicles. Could you see they all have like points of motion. They all have gears on them. They all have the ability to make movement. Mm -hmm. um, in, in this next slide, um, where you still have your sculptures, but something different is happening because you creating a particular tableau and here you are intentionally taking on a particular, you know, political historical subject. Um, how how does this come together from the you know creating the reckoning sculptures and the power figures? How 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 does the much larger installations come together for you? Well, I'm a performer, so I grew up doing theater. I grew up in May doing you know 
working in made environments and performing language and with sets and with this whole world that was crafted to present a story. And so this uh, make going into installation from performance as a person who makes their own clothes, who was really interested in those sort of eruptive glamorous, luscious, dizzying, sort of kitschy um, styles of creativity that I saw around a lot of trans women when I was growing up in Los Angeles, that way that I could see that creating these outfits for themselves and these headdresses really was um, this, was this force that um, gave their lives meaning and and gave them hope and gave them like centered and focus. And so there were there are all these elements inside of my installations that have been a part of my entire life, theater, costume. My mother was a fiber artist. She costumed on Broadway um, and also making, you know, I grew up uh, the child of an artist. So my mother made us make so much stuff that we needed for our houses. Um, in this installation we're looking at is a sculpture incarnation of Lutz's Washington Crossing the Delaware. It's inside of an installation called Miracles and Glory Abound, the acronym which is MAGA. And I was thinking about, you know, being in the first, the first years of the Trump presidency and the first in 2016, in the first 27 days of of January of 2016, so many black trans women were killed and there was, it was something that was ongoing, but I keep track of, mm -hmm. I keep track of so many deaths, honestly. Mm -hmm. I started making little memorials for people since when I was a little girl. And so I sort of still keep track of all these deaths so that I can make like a little artwork or a poem or prayer for, you know, I've done that for like hundreds of people who I never knew, but there was a way that that mm -hmm. year I really felt like the work of the imagination, the work to shape shift from the narrative that was running around on the streets and on the sidewalks really had to go through the realm, go through a realm of imagination and of visioning um, to like actually give an opportunity to see and feel a different world. And so miracles and glory abound um, sculptural incarnation of Lutz's Washington crossing De the Delaware, a painting they say is the most famous painting right. in um, America. But this work is filled, the boat is filled with black figures. There's 13 figures, there's an infant in the boat. Um, and I also have been really moved by the quote from Trick Non Hot that said, The next great revolutionary leader will not be a single individual, what will be an entire community. And I really started thinking, you know, sculpturally about communities of figures and the figures becoming an army that had the capacity to do violence to lies. And um, this installation is this sculptural central monument of of a not real city park. It's a fictitious city park where everything is an active theater. There are all these lookers in there. There is a projection of a city scene that has three different suns in it. It's, so it's like a work of science fiction and you see the, the sun set and rise so many different times a day. And it's this active theater that invites people into a place of imagining, into a place of wonder, and into a place of reckoning around myth. Like who gets to make the myths that we live by that people will, um, you know, like those sort of myths and traditions that become things that people wanna fight over about monuments. Who gets to make those new ones? Who gets to make the monuments? Who gets to make the myth? Who gets to make the story? Whose story gets to survive? And so this installation invites people into that act of theater for myself where I make this monument, which is a sculptural incarnation of Washington crossing the Delaware, but the entire monument is being led by a black girl figure whose entire body becomes the river that the monument is being, um, ferried forward, forward on. It's an incredible, pow powerful monument because it completely reshapes and transforms that story. Um, I, I included these um, little black Madonnas because they are so sweet and um, uh, again, you know, just 
uh, to, uh, speak to the sort of richness of your practice in terms of all the media that you have uh, traversed, but also because again, there's the recurring eyes, the recurring, um, you know, uh, uh, hairdos and elaborate kind of um, uh, hairstyling, but also the hearts and um, color, you know, color being also, as you say, this kind of magic and power. Um, here, there's lots of reds and yellows and, you know, um, the, the black and white that look like the sort of piano keys. Um, and the black Madonna on my right, on the right of my screen, um, has the heart on one leg and the eye on the other leg, um, you know. Uh, and so I'm, I'm just aware of our time too, uh, but I just really um, wanted to uh, in include these because they also speak so powerfully to um, all the different topics that we've touched on just in speaking about the sculpture and performance and the art house too. And so I just yeah. really love them. These black Madonnas were made when I was having to spend a lot of time at the hospital, at the cancer center and those trips to the ER when my mom was dying of cancer. And so I just looking at the material, that's a paper towel from the mm -hmm. emergency room at Shadyside Hospital with those triangles at the top, it, but the triangles are also in the piece, like they're all over the Black Madonna. Yeah. And the other Black Madonna with the white background is on a piece of Kleenex because they're always handing you Kleenex, you know, when you're at the cancer center at the hospital. But this for me speaks to the living power of art that I could bring a small, like the thimble size paints in my purse with two paintbrushes and go to the hospital and paint right where I was and painting the Black Madonna as a relief and as a call for soothing of my heart and to activate the power of that like expansive prayer that exists through the Black Madonna. It's really beautiful. And again, the, <laughs> contrast but similar to um you know the the uh um washington crossing the delaware installation but this is so much more campy so much more vibrant so much more over the top um and and i think this was also in pittsburgh at the mattress factory this installation but here you really bring out this sort of joyful celebratory carnivalesque you know procession and marching and again this movement you know that yeah is this What's really the contrast inside of this piece, because it is sort of gloriously, ridiculously campy. There are flowers erupting out of the floor. Like that entire installation is built into the floor. So it looks like the ground has opened up and it has arrived through an eruption of space. Mm. Uh, and what mm. is happening is there's a soundtrack playing. There's, uh, it's an 18 minute soundtrack that goes from the sound of the simultaneity of time, which is like 32 layers of sound, water and wind and crying and singing. And then it goes into a radio show that I created uh, for this work called the Sometimes We Cannot Be With Our Bodies radio show. Sometimes We Cannot Be With Our Bodies is the name of this installation. And it is uh, the sound of people talking about their loved ones who had been killed by the police or um, murdered like black trans women who have been murdered, um, Latino trans women who had been murdered and their loved ones talking about them. But it's mixed down with Chicago style house music that you, it just bumps, there's like subwoofers and it just, it bumps and it bumps and it bumps and then the music goes away. And it's just the sound of time moving around in the space. And so it is like really a high contrast, dramatic experience because none of those figures have heads, but they are all, right. there's that sense of motion. And so it's dis, it's sort of disturbing because the heads are in the room right before this. You walk into a room of heads and then you walk into a room where everybody's dancing around headless figures. And mm -hmm. so there's a lot that is called upon in this installation. Well, I mean, at the heart of it is that violence, 
right, that you are speaking to, the violence against the body, the queer body, the, you know, racial. And the reckoning with that violence, the reckoning, because the thing that makes the violence take all the water out of your body and out of, you know, take the breath out of you is that these are lives of these human beings are so beautiful. And so like you hear Trayvon Martin's mother talk about how handsome her son was and how he wore the best cologne and girls loved him. And what you have is the contrast between the radiance and the brilliance of these creative human lives, these human beings who, you know, some of the figures represent children who were killed by the police. They were while they were playing. You know, so there is what's happening is it is an honoring of the magic and the power and of what it is to be alive and to be like praised in your strangeness, um, but also what it means then to be in a world that cuts that down. What is what is that? And how then do you carry on? Mm -hmm. How then do you roll forward? How then do you move on this land with what deliberate love? And with what deliberate rage do you then move forward? Um, our final slide before we open up for some questions and um, more broader discussion with everyone who's here um, are the three collage, mixed media collages that are in the current show, um, Living in America Act Four. Um, which is around the theme of care. And we chose to display these as a triptych, even though they are not necessarily a triptych, but um, uh, they uh, all are um, different interpretations of the same New York Times magazine cover. And I remember this that because they, they had done um, covers with Serena Williams as well as Venus Williams. Um, and I think you have work on, on both of them as well. Um, and here, this is probably the closest to um, printmaking techniques, collaging, working with paper and the materiality of that. Uh, but again, I, I think that the work, your work has this duality too of this incredible opulence and beauty, but also this kind of dark you know, or uh, um, pointing towards uh, the the underbelly, you know, um, and the reverse, and how these things co two things co coexist and coalesce, and you know, always in relation to each other. Um, and so, I urge you to visit the show at IPCNY um, to see these in person. They are incredibly powerful works on their own. Um, and the magazine is true to size, you know, it's true, true to the size of the New York Times magazine. Um, but of course, the embellishments, the sculptural um, embellishments and additions that reimagine Venus as an astronaut, um, you know, uh, as. Uh, these different persona of, of um, incredibly beautiful and strong and adventurous and innovative women. Um, what inspired you to, to make these? I started them, I, th I, start the, I started them as a ritual of exploring um, freedom of material and freedom of being and uh, through Venus Williams with this like really um, glorious profile on the cover of the New York Times Magazine. So I'm, 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 I think I made 16 of these and I was exploring and playing and loosing into the freedom to um, place so many, many, whatever identity I wanted to upon this um, black, this extraordinary and rare, brilliant black woman. And so there was like Venus as an astronaut, Venus in the Garden of Eden, Venus as an opera diva. And in, you go from seeing the profile, her profile, to it being obscured by the, all of the little mirrors, which for me are these, uh, this poetic truth that you see yourself in that. You see yourself in many different selves in, in uh, the possibility of, through the possibility of um, connecting with 
you know, your humanity through that work and through the image of Venus and through like the life of Venus, like what is it possible for you to do and be um, what really expansively as a human being? You're muted. Thank you, my love. That certainly comes across in when you're standing in front of the collages as well. Um, I know that we've reached eight o'clock and um, I've, I've uh, uh, hope that if people have questions, they will put it in the chat. Um, I'm sure there are lots of questions and I'm sorry we've um, been chatting and uh, enjoying ourselves, having this amazing talk, um, but uh, please feel free to chat, uh, uh, to add your questions in the chat and um, we will answer them. Um, oh, uh, here's a question. Um, you are both a performer and a visual artist. What do you think about the differences each form provides um, performing art versus visual art. How does each one feed you? So different parts of you. All? I um. There's they a seem way very that interconnected. they're interconnected mm -hmm. because there's the, you know. For me, I'm performing work that I wrote and there is that process of gathering story, gathering language, assembling that language that is like into a sculptural form for the voice, you know, because I'm using sometimes, I'm using song, I'm using shape sound in my performance work, um, but it is sculptural and my sculptural work is performative in that it is like a lot of times it's very theatrical. Um, but there are ways that doing performance allows me, and I do performance at so many different scales. So at the Ford Foundation, there's a thousand people there. And then sometimes I just do performance one-on-one. -on -one. And it, the, uh, capa the ability to look into somebody's eyes and to be in connection and to, um, I do performances that are interactive and instinctive where I tell the audience, we're just gonna see what happens because we're here together and we're gonna, nobody, we're going to decide that we are going to move forward um, curious, curiously and passionately, but without harm or judgment. And I, we sort of make these performances together. Mm -hmm. And there's a way that doing that makes everybody a creator in the space that is really exciting and that um, is doesn't happen you know and with visual art but I love how visual art has this really sort of secret intimacy intimacy that allows people you know to stand in front of a work or to bear witness to a work whether it's a sound work a video work and have it in the intimacy of their own processing, their mind, their memories, their heart, their intellect, that to me is a really powerful place to, um, to like touch the humanity of, of people. Mm -hmm. And in that spirit, uh, I would invite everyone maybe to turn their cameras on and, you know, so we can see each other and we can share in that connection and we don't have to ask any more questions. Um, but I think that it would be beautiful. Uh, I know Vanessa um, is always speaking and, and in community and seeing lots of people. Um, but uh, I don't think we, we can do that though, because uh, this is a webinar and I forgot all about that. Um, so please say hi in the chat, uh, send us a wave. Um, and uh, we really appreciate you all being here. And I would like to, to conclude with maybe paraphrasing one of the other artists in 
our exhibition living in America, William Villalongo, um, who says uh, at the end of his artist statement on his work in the show, um, I want to say that to anyone attending the Zoom in this case, that we are getting through this and there will be more battles ahead. And so remember to take care of yourself and others. We wish you a very good night and thank you to Vanessa. Um, Thanks. Uh, thank you, Vanessa. Um, I, if you want, Vanessa, I think there is there is a question and maybe just one thing I, I would share um, in the Q&A to just we have a couple minutes. Um, we just have two comments, I think, that are not questions. Your work is extraordinary. The narratives are soulfully deep. I love your creativity. Thank you for this phenomenal presentation. Fantastic work, much appreciated. And another who says, um, my, you are now my new favorite artist. The love, passion, thought, and life that you channel into your work are apparent and tangible. Um, your, as a trans man in love with a transgender woman, your thoughtfulness regarding the humanity of the trans community is much appreciated. Um, and we're getting um, some other folks pouring in some love and appreciation. So thank you, including Mil Mildred Beltre, who's another artist in the show, Living America. So thank you. Um, folks for, for throwing those in at the end. Um, maybe on one concluding note, there's a question here from Emma. It says, Vanessa, your works in Living in America are absolutely dynamic and stunning. Do you conceive of your art as a way of taking care of a community? Moving forward, what do you have in mind in terms of caring for the community? So I do I conceive the works as acts of care? I do because um, you know, when I'm able to really focus, I invest so, you know, so there's the physical work that you see and there's also something that I call secret work, which is the work that happens while in the process of making the work. And so in the secret work, there's so much love inside of that, that I feel like um, people, we're about like, this is about to get super flowery. So like, just mm -hmm. hold on to your gossamer wings. So I feel <laughs> like when people, um, like if you look at the work with an open heart for however that is alive for you, that you open your heart to the love that is the secret work that is inside of the work. So that is an act of care, an ongoing act of care in any work of art that I create is I follow the love and there's love inside of the work. Um, and so I'm in future community care, um, one of the things that I'm really thinking a lot about is how to be honest and um, about wherever I am as a human being and sort of not, um, performing my life and giving everybody around me the permission to also not perform themselves, but to be present and alive and awake um, with like generosity of compassion for yourself, wherever you are. And like saying that out loud, because it, you know, as a medicinal, as medicinal air to be inhaled by the human beings around me who are sometimes so overwhelmed with stress, um, and brokenheartedness that uh, it just applies so much pressure and stress in their lives. So there's a way that um, I, I just say out loud sometimes how hard things are for me or how confusing they are or how um, beautiful things are. And just like speaking very clearly about how like struck I am by how beautiful the sky is and, and doing that as an act of community care and making more making space so people feel like in the strangeness of the world, they can honestly speak to how strange things are for them. And so I live in praise of weirdness and in praise of strangeness. Um, and, but then also one of the things that I've done more this year is made more spaces for black women and black femmes to live peacefully, expansively, without having to worry about their basic needs being met. So I own several houses in my neighborhood and all of them are occupied by 
Black women, Black femme artists, single mothers who, because the houses, because I, I live in the hood and I bought some of these houses for, you know, my sculptures sell for more than my houses. So, but they're like taking these beautiful houses that have all these different like colors and sculptural forms, but there are, so we're offering residency space and um, having like young artists in residence who are, you know, a, like that we're supporting in theater classes and dance classes, but really giving as a community care, making more spaces for black people, for brown people, for um, black trans women to just be, to just be and do however you need to do and be and you're being create whatever you need to create without the certain like financial stresses. So that's a way that I am carrying actively into the, my now community and into the future community is making more spaces, actually buying more property and buying more land and creating more spaces for black people to breathe and to create. Thank and you. Your, your, your garden has also been one such place for you um, as well as for your community, which is just such an extraordinary garden. And if any of you follow Vanessa on Instagram, you will um, catch glimpses of her in the garden performing all sorts of acts of care and attention and love and sometimes rage and anger and joy and celebration too. Vanessa, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, this was a really fabulously interesting talk. Thank you, Natasha, for guiding us through the conversation. Thank you, Vanessa, for raising so many interesting points. And I love how you describe this work as medicinal. I think that's like really and really instructive for how we think about care um, now. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Assembly Room, for putting Living in America together. Um, it is on view until December 19. Visit ipcny.org slash living in America for more. Um, our next exhibition will be our new prints 2021 winter with selections by the collective Black Women of Print. That's going to be in January. More information on that soon. Um, I also want to thank Marina Avia, who's been behind the scenes with us on all of our virtual programs for Living in America. She's running our Zoom tech. Um, and so thank you, Marina. And also both Caption Access and LNS Captioning, who've provided our captioners for our programs. Everyone watching, thank you for spending some of your Tuesday night with us. If you're already part of the IPCNY community, thank you for your continued support this year. If you're new to IPCNY tonight, thank you for joining us. We hope to see you in the future. Follow us on Instagram at IPCNY. Follow Assembly Room at Assembly Room NYC. Follow Vanessa at Vanessa L. German. Um, you're going to be directed to a two-question survey when the webinar ends. If you can just send two questions back to us, that would help us out so we can do better virtual programming as this pandemic carries on. Everyone, please take care. Everyone be safe um, and have a lovely night. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all.